The Nuts and Bolts of Writing, Season Two, a podcast where we talk about literature, the ins and outs of writing, and how to actually start writing. Hey there, everybody. This is your girl Tete Tate again, one of the co-hosts of the Nuts and Bolts in Writing. Today, we're resuming our mini-series on the Bioshock franchise, and today we're going to be focusing on another aspect of its most recent incarnation, Bioshock Infinite. And while it did receive mixed reviews, as we reviewed in the previous podcast episode, where we discussed about the main protagonist, Booker, we're here to talk again today about another very vital and important character. We are going to explore the Deuter antagonist, Elizabeth Comstock. So in our previous episode, while we discussed the solid characterization of Infinite's anti-hero, if you will, Booker DeWitt, we've decided today to take a look at one of Infinite's more unusual yet striking hallmarks, the importance of its deuter-tagonist Elizabeth Comstock. She proved a real show stealer. Differing from most players, you know, like main player companions, Elizabeth was not relegated to witty sidekick relief for comic relief, nor did she fall into the category of functional healer or a boring accompaniment. Elizabeth's own narrative influenced the game's story and heavily influenced us, the gamers, as we played Booker and bonded with this resilient heroine. As Elizabeth has also proven a unique departure from many female characters. She wasn't the romantic focus of the main character, and her story, while woven in the tragic consequences throughout the main character's connection, was not reduced to a sob story. Brandishing her own strength, Elizabeth takes the course of her own fate into her hands, even at the shocking conclusion of the game, Booker's. It's also interesting to note that while I was watching the gameplay of Bioshock Infinite, I noticed a lot of psychological, emotional, and social struggles that Elizabeth had, as well as her psychological complexes from growing up in a controlling, abusive structure, if you will, mirrored a lot of my own. And it was quite, quite unnerving, but perhaps in a very good way. In many ways, I feel like Elizabeth kind of represents a lot of a lot of unfortunate people who were raised in very trapped, abusive households and may have suffered consequences of very damaging uh, home-based, quote-unquote, education, which was nothing more than inglorious, uh, glorified doctrination of abuse. However, without further ado, I again welcome the fantastic, marvelously talented Fortunus Games as we delve into more about Elizabeth Comstock from Bioshock Infinite. Hi. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk about Bioshock with you again. I really enjoyed our previous episode where we talked about why you enjoyed the character Booker DeWitt so much. I know you really loved Elizabeth too, so we'll be exploring that more today. So the first question we'll discuss is, Elizabeth stands out from many female characters, especially in gaming. What do you think are the key traits that make her stand out? Boy, that is an excellent question. She really does stand out. You know, so many female characters in gaming, you know, they're either a romantic interest or sort of a, you know, the classic you know, companion sort of character, or even if they do are, even if they are the sole protagonist, it's usually, it follows a different narrative than what you see from a male protagonist. So I think what makes Elizabeth stand out is that, you know, she's very well fleshed out. She's fully formed. And we, through the eyes of Booker, develop this bond with her. And, and we definitely, you know, as, as one person had said, when I, when I first played Bioshock, I was not a father, but now playing it again as a father, I totally understand how Booker feels, the, the, uh, par to paraphrase the quote from this player. Um, but I think the traits that make Elizabeth stand out is that, you know, she doesn't fulfill any kind of romantic role. She's not really a classic companion because she's, 
she's very much in how do i say she's very much working together with the protagonist you know and that makes her you know as invested into what's happening in the game as we are mm -hmm. and i think another thing too is that she's allowed to have flaws she's allowed to have vulnerabilities but she's remarkably resilient so i think that's what makes her stand out and i think it's just the way her story is narrated that makes her extremely extremely compelling mm -hmm. right second question what makes her story and personality carry the story so well why is she so vivid that's a very that's also another excellent question um so I, I would like to, you know, propose this question to you. I mean, I'll certainly give my input, but what do you believe makes her story and personality carry the story so well? I think it's because, you know, she changes a lot throughout the story. And also how she's introduced to us is weaved into the story. She's not just there because she's a love interest or, you know, she's there for fan service. Although some of her, uh, her mm, out yeah was a little bit fan service and you know what booker eventually does at the end of the game is because of his bond with elizabeth he wouldn't have agreed to do that was it not for her very true very true um i think also too like i had mentioned you know she is allowed to have flaws she is allowed to be selfish you know kind of short-sighted um but at the same time she has other great qualities like she's very compassionate she's very resilient i think that's also what makes her vivid and th there's just something about her her energy that you don't you seldom see in many characters let alone you know a female dude protagonist you know a lot of times a female character is not really a dude protagonist it's usually a romantic interest or what have you but you know she she definitely stands on her own and i guess we can we as booker as the player are, we're very we're very proud of our daughter at the end of it you know exactly yes um do you think that's different from eleanor in bioshock 2 i want to say it's 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 rather different i mean the pro it's not the problem but i think the difference with eleanor is that we don't know her quite as well and much of what she has is kind of speculation and projection so it's really hard to get to know eleanor i guess the only thing we can say about eleanor is that she has a well organized and well executed plan but then again she has an advantage over elizabeth but at the same time i don't for me anyway personally i don't feel that organ that organic bonding as i did with elizabeth Mm hmm right and delta being a silent protagonist doesn't help right no even though i felt more for delta than i ever will for jack um yes for jack which you know we will we will delve into into the um next episode because he just he just looks like i don't know present day clint eastwood that's seen better days um <laughs> uh, I, I I don't feel anything. I mean, if anything, I feel kind of a lack of dis. I, I feel like a disconnection, and I, you know what? I don't feel any heart in one and two as I do in Infinite. Mm -hmm, I see. And number three. So for Tete, a former homeschooler, Elizabeth's own experiences and struggles strongly resonate with her. What are some of the parallels between? Elizabeth's challenges and Tete's and other homeschoolers challenges. Oh my, you know what? As soon as I saw Elizabeth and I thought, all right, wow, her setup. Her setup is exactly very much like an isolated homeschooler being raised by a toxic religious fanatical parent, um, except that we don't have science experiments done on us. And very few of us, many of us grew up in poverty, so we do not have a swank pad and, and neither do we have a songbird. Uh, so that's that we don't have those advantages and neither do we get like, you know, some nice bling either and an airship too. But um, the, the, but in all seriousness and all sobriety, uh, the challenge, the parallel between her challenges and other homeschoolers, one is the intense isolation. The isolation certainly does uh, mold and influence your psychology, your personality, but also your confident, 
to adapt into the world. Um, it also brings a very strong sense of naivety. You are so eager to taste the free and open world that you may not be aware of the dangers or, you know, the opposite for some, you become so paranoid because your parents have drilled it into your head that the world is a dark and threatening, dismal place, which many aspects of it is, you know, are unfortunately, but there are good things. So the parents will always present and, and instill in your mind a very imbalanced view of the world. And we see this kind of juxtaposed with, um, say, um, burial at sea, you know, Elizabeth has this very sunny, very stereotypical image of Paris in her mind where everyone is friendly. Um, the food, I guess, is reasonably cheap. And I don't know why there's a kid dancing with a baguette and everything feels like an impressionist painting, which to be fair, Paris being a big city like any other city is not really like that. I mean, there's probably a lot of great features to Perry, but um you know, it, it, it shows her naivety. But you can also see, too, the way she yearns for being open when she's kind of dancing in the pavilion on the beach. You know, there's such a yearning to be open and free. You know, I guess to quote that Elton John song, how wonderful life is now that you're in the world. Um, but I think the downside for Elizabeth, too, for her isolation is that she may not know how to adapt or the practical aspects of learning how to do practical things in the real world, which many homeschoolers struggle. Um, the biggest struggle for any homeschooler is adulting. It's not so much that many of our parents uh, infantilized us or anything like that or denied us responsibilities, but many of us were forced to grow up too fast. It causes this weird lag, if you will, it's like jet lag, but only with adulting. And you don't know a lot about social cues, social confidence. And it's like, you may be able to write a very fancy resume, but you know, by God, if they ask you to like, you know, do small tech at a part, small talk at a party, you're going to die. I mean, that is, that is how bad the, uh, isolation is. And, um, I, I don't see so much Elizabeth struggling with socialization, but she is very open. She is very naive and Booker, like any, you know, parent that suddenly their, 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 you know, father mode gets activated. You would be very alarmed for your child going out in the world, which is why you want to follow her. And even though it says she can defend herself, it's like, maybe I should bring this Glock gun just in case, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm, definitely. Right. And the fact that, you know, she only gets glimpses of the outside world through tears, but never has the the courage to go through them. That's true, exactly. I, I think that could be a very good parallel, if you will, for many homeschoolers who get exposed to things through the internet. You know, we, we see these things or we enjoy memes or pop culture through the osmosis of the internet, um, but we never get to enjoy things that a lot of things that people take for granted, like graduation parties, dances, uh, any of the social milestones of adolescence, or even that would carry on to adulthood. Many homeschoolers are unfortunately uh, denied that. And many homeschoolers too, once they grow up, they may be afraid to pursue a lot of things, maybe relationships, maybe friendships, maybe this goes on to um, affecting their academic aspect. Many of them will be scared to pursue higher education, or if they do, they find themselves backing out of it because they are afraid they cannot, they cannot with, withhold the the rigor of, of that academic discipline as, as they pursue higher education. What do you think is, um, um, the barrier because you know for example elizabeth is well very well read and i mean this isn't relevant to her story but you know just as a small detour what do you think is the difference between someone who is a well-read homeschooler versus you know someone who may not be well read but you know doesn't have any problems pursuing higher education so i think i think well read is a bit of a misnomer because in order to be a learning person your mind needs to be molded into a discipline to learn. And that has to be activated and that, that needs to be influenced and formed from an early age. And if your mind is just selectively exploring one subject or one aspect, 
you've neglected everything and you don't have you you're not going to have the learning mindset that's necessary to pursue you know a, a well-rounded education and so you can be well read i mean you can you can memorize shakespeare you can know the thesaurus and put together you know an articulate argument or debate or an article but if you don't have the discipline of being a rigorous learner and and having a schedule and a structure and following a mindset that encourages learning and comprehension then that's that is the fatal difference and that is why a lot of people mistake being well read for being a learner and the, and those are two very very different things it's like you know for example i i could i don't know i i could i could quote the whole of Shakespeare's Richard II, but I can't, I do a very, very poor job of trying to translate, you know, science data on a sheet, you know, <laughs> ACT showed me that I did mm -hmm. not know what I was doing. But, but that that's, that's the main difference between a learning mind and what is well read. Mm -hmm, I see, right. And I guess it's like what Elizabeth says in Burial at Sea, because she says, all I have is like a bunch of lockpicks and, you know, a lot of books, you know, but just book knowledge and nothing else. But then I guess for her, it's also selective because, you know, it's only, well, I guess she's not that selective. Like a real life homeschooler would be more selective because luckily for her, she knows chemistry and that's how she ends up, you know, replying to atlas about certain things and figuring out how to use su chong's lab because i think a real life homeschooler would probably not have that specific interest it would just be paris and nothing else probably it, it, i i want to say it depends on the student i mean there are these very rare students that excel in the sciences and math but then they may not have any comprehension of english which you know, I, I I see I see it as this. If your forte is in one subject and not the other, you can use that to your advantage. But what's necessary is that in early education that you learn all of the disciplines, therefore you have a learning mind because being able to understand math and science, that equips your brain to learn other things, uh, other necessary skills, and it just develops all aspects you know, of the mind and how you apply yourself. But yes, I think Elizabeth, had she been in like homeschool as, as me, and, me and, and as myself and others, um, it would be far more selective. I don't know, maybe she would have just been a chem student and that's it. And I don't know, that, that would be kind of to her advantage. But if it would have just been book knowledge and all she can do is like, I don't know, memorize literature or whatever, um, or interpret it, then yeah, I, that's not going to help. I mean, thank God that she does know chemistry and lock picking, or we would be in, you know, <laughs> knee deep trouble, you know, like, workers, can you open this? No, but I know this, I know this thing by, uh, you know, shop nurse says, that ain't going to help me, Lizzie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number four, we kind of covered already, but we'll talk about the nationalist aspect of her schooling. So how is Elizabeth's isolation similar to extreme, and I'm going to put in these words, Christian nationalist homeschooling? Because we already talked about the isolation thing. Right. It is so similar. Um, uh, when I saw how Elizabeth was living, it kind of scared me. It reminded me of my upbringing a lot um except i i didn't have a swank pad i didn't have a cool library and i didn't have a songbird <laughs> and no cool airship either um but all those trapping aside um the kind of isolation the longing for friendship and warmth and, and human interaction beyond my my family circle which was not 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 always a positive thing which i, I won't go into you know, I, I think a lot of homeschoolers kind of know what I'm talking about from those of us who have come from broken families and things like that. Um, but the isolation is you are you are in an insular vacuum of the same thoughts, the same politi political ideology and the same religious fanaticism. I mean, you know, it comes to the point where the patriarch of the family won't even associate or consider being near people who do not 100% agree with their religious fanaticism or political ideology. And 
it's very damaging and and they they portray or they instill such a false image of the world and society onto their children that it makes their children either fearful or prejudiced uh with, with me it was it was the for, the the la you know i was very fearful i didn't i didn't have prejudice per se um but i was very fearful but i i had such a craving to see what was out there because i saw snippets of what the world was through like elizabeth through reading and online which i guess you could say is like her you know library and her her tears you know mm -hmm. um but yes that is that is pretty much it, it's it's very much part and parcel um I, I, I almost wonder if uh, Ken himself, I don't know if he studied homeschooling experience because it's that scary. It, it does. Okay, number five, Elizabeth struggles too with a toxic parent. So we already kind of talked about this too. What are the effects we can see manifest in her life and mindset? So I definitely want to say that, yes, yeah, she has grown up with a very toxic, almost absent figure to a degree. Um she the the effects that we see manifest in her life is a lot of anger a lot of resentment a lot of feeling that she has to fight for things on her own that she doesn't feel that there is a support system to help her um but also too i think kind of a very bitter cynicism that's instilled in her that you kind of have from having a toxic parent and kind of being pen parentrified yourself, maybe that you're not taking care of the parent, but that you yourself must, you know, take care of oneself. Mm -hmm. I think other things we see too as um, Elizabeth's reluctance to accept help, and I think too the 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 struggle with adulting. I mean, I think Burial at Sea was a good example of that. Um, I think you know Burial at Sea, although we kind of argue that she wouldn't end up in rapture. I think it's a good symbolism of what happens when when you carry the scars of this when you when you don't overcome that and you and you succumb to that fatalism if you will right and we're going to that so number six although it is it may be considered non-canonical burial at sea gave us a glimpse into an alternate elizabeth was she out of character or did we see the further effects of her past catch up with her I definitely want to say that I guess for some things it was out of character a little bit. Um, I want to say the um, femme fatale thing definitely felt out of character. Um, but at the same time, she could be in some ways weaponizing her femininity to serve her purpose. But the further effects of her past catching up with her, I knew it as soon as I saw her rosy, pink picture of Paris. I was like, okay, this is pretty much a naive homeschooler going out into the world, having such a rosy, rosy, picturesque view of living somewhere else. And I say this because I experienced this a little bit as, as a young kid, like 15 to 16. My biggest dream was to live in New York. I thought it would be kind of like in like Friends or like Sex in the City. <laughs> but, but no, it's not. It, New York is, I mean, don't get me wrong. Every city has a lot of wonderful features and attributes, but then there's a lot of sad and negative things. And if you don't acknowledge that or the fact that so many cities are obscenely high to live in, um, you know, you're, you're going to end up with a very rosy, picturesque view like Elizabeth. Like I wasn't thinking about kids running around with baguettes, but I was thinking about, you know, elegant New York apartments and you know, taking walks in Central Park and drinking, you know, barista coffee and talking about books with, I don't know, an intellectual. But then I realized most of the reality I would probably face is I'm going to live in a crappy tenement and I'm, I'm going to get, I don't know, mugged in the Bronx or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and people don't want to talk about literature, probably. <laughs> no, I think I think somebody's going to, if they're not telling me to get out of the way, they're either going to punch me or or just coldly ignore me just because i guess for the most part i i don't know i don't know the character of new york people give me all sorts of different uh accounts some people tell me oh they're the friendliest and then some people say oh they're horrid but i i don't know what to believe but if there's anybody who's listening to this podcast from new york city 
uh, please chime in below which part you're from and what is it what is it like living in your area <laughs> i think that's kind of hard to generalize <laughs> but yeah um i mean i guess it depends on what they're doing too i mean it's so different for everyone that's true and you know that's another thing it's different for everyone i mean and some people uh, don't care with pe if people are friendly because they're not their friends so they only think about whether their friends are friendly to them and of course they're going to say yes they're not going right. to think about the person in the park not saying hi back to them because it's not important to them exactly you know i think that's a big thing too people often don't understand those social cues of of modern life um but yeah i i guess to you know go further into the effects of her i guess also too elizabeth does not have any direction in rapture like she is not starting a business i mean with her chemistry knowledge she wouldn't have to work for sander cohen i mean she could honestly work for i don't know start her up start her own chemistry business collaborate with one of the so-called geniuses of rapture although i don't know if i'd want to collab with any of the geniuses <laughs> um, they're very disturbing well i guess she is mm -hmm. she is collabing i guess sanders a quote-unquote genius um no he is and did she work for him though not really i, I mean I don't just know. for that specific scene I, I think she just snuck into his place i think she didn't know who he was because she asked booker who is this sander cohen when we go in that's true. Um, I don't know. I was reading some sort of lore that people were speculating that she knew what it was about, though, and that she was playing Booker. But then that's just fan lore. Like, that's fan speculation. Yeah, because I'm not really sure. I think that one poster where a uh, Cohen is with her and says that she's his new songbird was created after that scene she and Booker were in. So that's how he got to know her, because I don't think he knew who she was before that that's true and and if this is the case then that shows my goodness elizabeth what have you been doing with your life in rapture i mean not that there's anything to do in rapture but i think her whole plan was to lure um booker and then you know just basically you know put him to use because she wants to get rid of him remember with the whole sally thing and that's why she that's feels true. guilty for doing that because she was so hell-bent on revenge that's very true. That's why she does have that guilt. And when we look at it that way, that I think that can happen to some people who are damaged in life. They are only, they're fixated on one goal and that goal is very short term and it is not sustainable. You know, if it's something like whatever, uh, a career that may not take off, like a career that is not viable or an idea that is not viable and they just fixate on basically trying to beat a dead horse then you know that 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 in itself spells a disaster rather than willing to compromise and adapt which are necessary skills for pretty much getting ahead yeah definitely and also it shows that she's not um someone who's practical like she's so obsessed with her own own emotions and having revenge on comstock that she doesn't care about anything else exactly if if the adult who grows up from this kind of living doesn't learn to be stoic about their emotions or detach themselves from the emotions and focus on the goal then they are going to end up in a similar situation i mean not as dire as elizabeth but they are going to end up with a life that is symbolically a, a burial at sea. Mm -hmm, exactly. Finally, what can we learn from the outcome of both infinite and burial at sea? So infinite obviously has a more um, fulfilling conclusion. Um, infinite, you know, we see that Elizabeth having ended Booker originally uh, and ends the cycle of events and she is she is she is she has ended the cycle and has almost like ended her own existence too um i i but then the course that you do have that cut scene at the end the post credit scene where there is this happier ending where booker is alive and he goes into the room and and he finds his child, or at least we think he finds his child because we hear a baby giggling. And 
I, I think it's, I think the outcome of this is, I think people need to be wary of their actions and consequences because when you decide to bring other people into the equation, you have created a legacy, whether that is good or bad. And I want to say to anybody who potentially is wants to have children or is going to have children or is going to do anything. I mean, even if that's starting a business or starting a school or whatever have you, the fact is you're going to be responsible for other people that will be with you and you need to take very careful consideration of your actions and the consequences because they those will have a long cyclic effect and i think that's the ultimate lesson of of infinite in my opinion and i think with burial at sea burial at sea is a very it's a very dire warrant warning it's a very somber warning what happens when you become fix fixated on a short short term goal and mm -hmm. be that revenge or whatever or emotional fulfillment D never be fixated on one singular short term goal i agree yeah because the whole thing wouldn't have happened if elizabeth wasn't obsessed with you know destroying every comstock in every reality like is that necessary i mean she could have just said okay i got rid of the comstock who ruined my life i'm just going to move on now Exactly, because I mean, who on earth is who on earth is Comstock ruining and Rapture? I mean, everyone's pretty much ruined, or you can't do any more damage, Kenny. <laughs> exactly. Well, I guess he did ruin someone. Remember in the flashback, you know that Elizabeth in his reality died because instead of her pinky getting cut off, it was her head. So I guess Elizabeth is avenging the version of herself who got her head cut off. But I mean, at what cost? That's true. And, and also there's nothing you can do for the, unfortunately, the individual who perished. There's nothing you can do for that individual. Exactly. You know? So if you can't do anything for them, then I, I think it's almost kind of arrogance to do this because you almost kind of become a martyr for them. You do. And I, I didn't quite grasp the motivation of that because if there's nothing you can do for that individual, except for some vague abstract sense of justice but who's the justice for it's not going to be for the parent or or anything like that it, it's not going to do anything for anyone not even for elizabeth so why mm -hmm. is she doing this i mean i think that was the the main uh, you know to quote shakespeare i there's the rub you know Exactly. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was a really, really interesting podcast. And we explored a lot of things about Elizabeth and homeschooling. Yes, we did. Thank you so much. This was an awesome discussion. Right. See you next time.